Okay, welcome back everyone to Grockets OG TV. You're listening to me, Jim Jacobson, like it says up here. That's me, and that's actually a picture of me, even though it's probably too small to tell. You're listening to Grocket.com, <clears throat> and this is the GMAT aspect of Grocket, where we do tutoring and uh, provide question banks as well as do these broadcasts. This particular broadcast is going through the official guide to the test the one with the purple cover, and it's the 12th edition of that official guide, the one with the uh, gold writing. And we're going question by question, cover to cover, through the whole thing, uh, really where we is me. Well, we, uh, we means me and you, the listener. How about that? And uh, so we're about in the middle of the book, actually a little bit over halfway at this point. And we left off, uh, last time we just started the critical reasoning se section. So um, <clears throat> we're going to pick up where we left off with that. And uh, that point is page 489. So the idea here, in case you just tuned in, is that you follow along in your book. And if there are, so that you uh, also can, you know, work on these questions and understand what I'm saying. I'm not going to write down or present on the screen every question that exists. It's probably a violation of copyright anyway. Um, and uh, so uh, a your own copy of the 12th edition of the official guide is required to get the most out of this broadcast. Anyway, uh, we finished off with question number 11 on page 488 and 489. So we're starting off with question four uh, on page 489 with question 12. I will read the <clears throat> passage in question as always, and then we'll talk about it. So number 12, a certain automaker aims to increase its market share by deeply discounting its vehicle's prices for the next several months. The discounts will cut into profits, but because they will be heavily advertised, the manufacturer hopes that they will attract buyers away from rival manufacturers' cars. In the longer term, the automaker envisions that customers initially attracted by the discounts may become loyal customers. In assessing the plan's chances of achieving its aims, uh, it would be most useful to know which of the following. So remember, we, we talked about uh, uh, plans and forecasts and things like that. Um, <clears throat> that one of the keys is uh, evaluating them on their own terms. Um, you know, w when we're talking about strengthening or weakening it or determining what determining what information would strengthen or weaken the plan, it does need to be on the terms of the plan as presented. So yes, it is possible. It would be useful to know whether the Earth were going to be destroyed by a comet, because if the Earth is destroyed by a comet, um, <clears throat> customers uh, initially attracted by the discounts to the automaker's plan, excuse me, <clears throat> Uh, customers initially attracted will be destroyed by the same comet that destroys everything else. So uh, there are things that could be outside the scope of the passage as presented. What we need are things that are in the plan or forecast um, as presented that would either make or break it, so to speak. So, um, and we always want to sum summarize for ourselves what that plan actually is. In this particular case, uh, and, and when we summarize it, we need to do it as concisely as possible because then we can compare uh, answer choices against that more concise summary of the situation. So um, the whole plan here is very inexpensive cars will attract customers away from their rivals and those rivals will stay. Or those customers will stay with, with the, you know, they came for the discount but then they stay out of loyalty. So um, in order to determine whether that would work, I guess we need to look at in terms of, uh, it helps if you can to predict what sort of thing the answer choice might look like. So we have two elements of the plan. One is that deep discounts attract customers. So, uh, you know, if there's anything that could cause customers not to be attracted by the deep discounts, that would be one thing that could weaken the plan or strengthen it if it were found out that they, nothing else were going to stop them. And then also, uh, the, the other aspect of the plan is that um, some customers will stay, uh, or that a number of those customers will stay out of brand loyalty. And so uh, something that strengthens it would be something that says, well, you know, studies have shown that once people switch brands of auto, um, 
or makers of, of, of automobiles that they stay with that the one that they switch to. So a study like that would strengthen it. Um, something that could weaken it would be um, uh, just, just as easily a study that shows that people change uh, make and model of their automobile very easily. So, um, with and obviously it took me a while to explain all of those uh, different ways that this could pan out. You would go through it much more quickly in your own head when you're doing it on test day. So, um, again, the two elements of the plan, um, cheap cars attract, um, and uh, they stay from loyalty. So uh, whatever, whatever answer choice is the correct one will um, affect one of those two things. Okay, so choice A. Uh, would it be useful to know whether the automaker's competitors are likely to respond by offering deep discounts on their own products? So if, if their competitors did offer deep discounts, the cheaper cars may not actually attract customers to the automakers in, in the certain automaker in the passage. So actually choice A does deal with this one. So we'll uh, put that little smiley face next to it to show that we like that one. Let's check the other ones. Choice B, whether the advertisements will be created by the manufacturer's current advertising agency. Well, uh, I mean, if we knew something else about the agency, like how, how effective it is, uh, that might matter. But just knowing whether it's the same agency is actually completely irrelevant. It neither deals with cheaper cars attracting customers or customers staying out of loyalty. Uh, choice C, whether some of the automaker's models will be more deeply discounted than others. <clears throat> so this is a very common wrong answer choice, creating a split where one does not exist. There is no distinction between brands in the passage. Um, different brands under this, made by the same automaker are not even mentioned. So while in the real world this might actually matter, um, this is a very wrong or very common wrong answer choice uh, on the GMAT because it introduces a detail that is not an element of the original plan. And that makes it not correct. Uh, choice D, whether the automaker will be able to cut costs sufficiently to maintain profit margins even when the discounts are in effect. You may, you may remember last time, if you were watching yesterday's broadcast, that I mentioned two of the common wrong answer choices either deal with money or time, <clears throat> when those things are not actually part of the original um, part of the original plan or forecast or passage in general. In this case, they're, they're trying to attract those business minds out there of yours, those future MBA minds. Um, and uh, so, yes, uh, whether it's whether they would be able to cut costs sufficiently would be an important part of their plan, but that's not actually what the question is asking. The question is asking um, which of the following things would determine its, its, how successful it is on um, these, on one of two uh, plan elements. And whether, whether they make enough money in the process of doing that was not what we were actually asked. So D is not it. But that's one of those scary answer choices that they that they throw in a lot. Be scary because it, it can uh, attract those bright minds out there. Um, choice E, whether an alternative strategy might enable the automaker to enhance its profitability while holding a constant or diminishing share of the market. So alternate strategy, um, this is basically outside the scope of the passage. Uh, we are only being asked about what we would need to know about the efficacy of this particular plan, again, on these two fronts. And so what alternate strategies that may or may not do something okay, nobody cares. Or at least you shouldn't for the purposes of this question. So that leaves us only with answer choice A. It actually directly addressed the, the uh, point of whether um, customers would be attracted by these deep discounts. And if uh, the competitors offered deep discounts of their own, it might not work. All right, oops, 489, question number 13. In Swarkhand's territory, archeologists discovered charred bone fragments dating back 1 million years. Analysis of the fragments, which came from a variety of animals, showed that they had been heated to temperatures no higher than those produced in experimental campfires made from the branches of white stinkwood, the most common tree around Swarkhand's. 
Which of the following, if true, would, together with the information above, provide the best basis for the claim that the charred bone fragments are evidence of the use of fire by early hominids? Okay, so the question is ultimately asking us to uh, connect that fire and the bones to early hominids. So we need an answer choice that um, relates the two. Um, so other things will be irrelevant. That's what the question is specifically asking us for. Let's take a look and see what we get. Uh, choice A, the white stinkwood tree is used for building material by the present day inhabitants of Swartkans. I may not be pronouncing that right. It may not even be a real place, in which case I can say, how, say it however I like. Um, in this case though, um, in this question, in this answer choice, um, again, we needed to connect the fire or the bones um, to these early hominids. And just knowing the present day inhabitants of the area use that as a building material, nobody cares about the present day inhabitants. We only care about fire, bones, and hominids for, for the next however many minutes. Uh, choice B, forest fires can heat wood to a range of temperatures that occur in campfires. So this actually weakens, this is exactly the opposite of what we're after. Uh, by saying that forest fires could have caused this fire that uh, had these bones next to it, um, that they were you know, in the normal range of um, campfires, that that could have been a forest fire, weakens the notion that it could have been these early hominids that were there. So this is in, in fact the exact opposite, but it is the right sort of thing. It, is, um, it, it, it at least has the fire in it. <laughs> as opposed to bone. Uh, choice C, the bone fragments were fitted together by the archeologists to form the complete skeletons of several animals. I guess I could actually, um, so let's see. Choice B had fire. Choice uh, C has the bones, um, but we need to connect fire or bones to hominids and choices B and C so far don't do that. Oops, wrong color. Not that it matters. Uh, choice D, apart from the Swartkan's discovery, there is reliable evidence that early hominids used fire as many as 500,000 years ago. I suppose, technically, I should have made this. We need to connect the fire or the bones to the Swartkan's hominids. Uh, choice D um, says that early hominids elsewhere used fire, but there's nothing that says this particular campfire and these particular bones are uh, evidence of early fire by these Swartkans hominids. So while this one does connect, um, so D connects uh, fire to hominids, it's the other kind, which is, or other, you know, ones elsewhere, which is not what we need. Process of elimination does get us to choice E is the correct one, but we should probably look at it just to be safe. If you were in a hurry later on on the GMAT, you know, further on to the test, and you might, and if you found yourself a little bit behind on questions, I, I mean, we feel pretty confident in in our reasons for eliminating A through D. You could just, you know, circle E and say, okay, my shift's over. I'm ready to move on to the next question. Um, if you are doing okay on time, you should always check because uh, errors in logic can occur. And as unfortunate as that is, it's, it's a part of life. So anyway, choice E, the bone fragments were found in several distinct layers of limestone that contained primitive cutting tools known to have been used by, the, by early hominids. So uh, choice E here ties the bones to the Swartkens hominids um, because the bones were right next to the fire and the whole thing takes place in that area, so E is our correct answer. Still page 489, last one on page 489, question number 14. In Washington County, attendance at the movies is just large enough for the cinema operators to make modest profits. The size of the county's population is stable and is not expected to increase much. Yet there are investors ready to double the number of movie screens in the county within five years, and they are predicting solid profits both for themselves and for the established cinema operators. Which of the following, if true, about Washington County most helps to provide a justification for the investor's prediction? 
So we need to justify the investor's prediction. The prediction equals solid profits. And uh, so that's, in a sense, that's the conclusion of the argument. There will be solid profits. Um, the, but this isn't a standard, um, you know, evidence plus assumption equals conclusion. This is not that. Um, because it's this one's more about a, a proposal or a prediction, which um, in this particular case, we don't actually have any evidence for the prediction that's made. In fact, we have evidence contrary to the prediction that's made. That's why it doesn't really fit this particular model. This particular model does uh, work for many uh, GMAT CR questions, but this is not one of them. So anyway, moving on. So the prediction is that there will be solid profits for, uh, what was it, five in five years with uh, doubling the number of theaters, solid profits for the existing theaters and the new ones. So, um, but population is not expected to change. So we need a reason why profits would go up rather, rather, uh, rather, to, to a rather great extent um, without the population itself actually changing. So, um, we need profits up, population the same. So, let's look for an answer choice that does that for us. Uh, choice A, over the next 10 years, people in their teenage years, the prime movie-going age, will be a rapidly growing proportion of the county's population. So, this one's interesting. Um, the, uh, the prime movie-going age is teenagers. And that proportion, um, that uh, fraction of the overall population is going to increase, which means, of course, since the population is going to stay the same, we had already established that. Um, and the, But that proportion it goes to movies more, profits would go up. So choice A actually fits uh, our criteria for having population stay the same and have a reason for profits going up. Let's check the other answer choices, though. Uh, choice B, as distinct from the existing cinemas, most of the cinemas being planned would be located in downtown areas in hopes of stimulating an economic revi revitalization of those areas. So the problem with this, of course, is number one, it distinguishes between the existing cinemas and the planned ones. And according to the passage, they're all expected to get um, solid profits uh, up from the modest profits that they are currently receiving. So according to the passage, this whatever is going to happen is going to happen to all the theaters. Um, also, uh, choice B, so just you know putting the new um, putting new theaters in downtown areas for economic revitalization does not necessarily mean that profits are going to go up. In fact, if the movie going population stays the same, why would they? It might um, trigger an eco economic revitalization. Here we're going kind of into outside knowledge. It might trigger an economic revitalization, but if the, if it did, it would probably be at the expense of the existing cinemas. People might go to the downtown theaters instead of the ones that are further out of town, and that's contrary to the goals of the question. So it's not B. Uh, choice C: Spending on video purchases as well as spending on video rentals has been increasing modestly each year for the past ten years. If anything, this would weaken their prediction. If more, more and more people are renting videos and buying movies, you know, on VHS or DVD, um, or increasingly digitally and in, in you know MP4s or something like that, if they're if they if purchases are going up, uh, it would suggest that people would be going to theaters less in the next five years. Certainly not enough to warrant um, additional theaters. So it's not C. Uh, D, the average number of screens per cinema is lower among existing cinemas than it is among cinemas still in the planning stages. So this is one of those false splits, creating a distinction that doesn't exist as part of the prediction. And again, the prediction specifically applies to both existing theaters and these planned ones, that all of them should be getting increased profits. It doesn't matter whether there's more screens per cinema. Um, it's irrelevant. 
And then choice E, the sale of snacks and drinks in cinemas accounts for a steadily growing share of most cinema operators' profits. So while that is true, that would be true whether they build more cinemas or not. And on top of that, um, even if it is a steadily growing share, um, steadily growing, I mean, if it were 100% of the, um, the profits, then sure, maybe, maybe uh, they could support a couple more theaters. But they actually need uh, the number of people going to, th the number of people walking through the door for, for a given movie to be greater for profits to go up to the extent that they've planned in the, or proposed or, or predicted, sorry, in the, uh, in the passage. So choice E, not it. So choice A, uh, lots of teenagers, so uh, children becoming teenagers in the next five years uh, is a reasonable expectation that profits would go up. Turning the page. Page 490, question number 15. A conservation group in the United States is trying to change the long-standing image of bats as frightening creatures. The group contends that bats are feared and persecuted solely because they are shy animals that are active only at night. Which of the following, if true, would cast the most serious doubt on the accuracy of the group's contention? So sometimes, you know, of course, they'll actually give you in that question stem, they will rephrase what the group's contention is. They didn't do it for us, and so we definitely need to do it. Um, their, their contention is that bats are, you know, sad, unhappy. What, what's the word I actually want to use? Uh, feared and persecuted, but so, okay, pretend that this sad face means feared and persecuted. Bats are sad um, because they are shy and nocturnal. So that's their contention. So in order to weaken it, uh, so th this is uh, what, what the, this is ultimately a causal argument, and causal arguments often have a shortcut. Um, so you know, causal arguments are x causes y. Um, so to weaken them, you can say no, x doesn't cause y. Uh, you could say um, y in fact causes x. You could say that no, actually it's z that causes y. And then in some cases you can also just say, um, no, actually, um, you know, x, x does, well, th those are basically the three ways that you could weaken it. So in this particular case, we could say, no, 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 um, their being shy and nocturnal doesn't really cause them being feared and persecuted. We could say that uh, they are, that th because they are feared and persecuted, that's what makes them shy and nocturnal. I don't think bats are actually aware of how people feel about them, so we can safely eliminate that one. Um, and we could actually say that um, it's something else that makes them feared and persecuted. So in this case, uh, sorry, we are saying shy and nocturnal causes fear. So to weaken it, we either need to say that no, shy and nocturnal doesn't cause fear, uh, or that something else causes that fear. So th that's the shortcut that you can use for any kind of causal argument when you have to weaken it. So it allows you to kind of zero in on what things you, you would need to do. Let's look for stuff like that in the answer choices. Uh, choice A, bats are steadily losing natural roosting places such as caves and hollow trees and are thus turning to more developed areas for roosting. Well, that's certainly a reason why people would see them more often, but it, that, that doesn't, it gives us neither um, uh, a different cause. We, it, it's not saying that shyness and nocturnalness are, are causing bats to be sad, nor is it saying that something else is causing people to be afraid of them. So it's not A. Uh, choice B, bats are the chief consumers of nocturnal insects and thus can help make their hunting territory more pleasant for humans. While true, that does not give us, um, uh, this does not, this, this neither denies that their shy nocturnal behavior causes people to be afraid of them, nor that something else causes that fear. 
Uh, Choice C, bats are regarded as frightening creatures not only in the, in the United States, but also in Europe, Africa, and South America. I wouldn't know, but that sounds plausible. But again, that doesn't give us, that doesn't do anything to the relationship between shyness and nocturnal behavior and, you know, sad bats. Uh, choice D, raccoons and owls are shy and active only at night, yet they are not generally feared and persecuted. So that actually sounds a lot like this one. So remember, th this, this answer choice here is, was that, um, that that shy night behavior is what is what caused the fear, uh, or or saying that that shyness and nocturnal behavior are not what causes the fear. By saying that there are these other species, owls and raccoons, that are shy and do stuff at night, and they're not people aren't scared of them, suggests that these factors are not what cause the fear. So choice D sounds pretty awesome. Let's check E. People know more about the behavior of other greatly feared animal species, such as lions, alligators, and snakes, than they do about the behavior of bats. Other animals, totally irrelevant. Which leaves us only answer choice D, giving us, uh, basically saying that shyness and nocturnal behavior are not going to do it. So still page 490, and question number 16. Which of the following best completes the passage below? Okay, so uh, when you get a, when you get to complete the passage one, there actually isn't a whole lot of planning or predicting that you can do um, you, until you're actually within the passage. Once you're within the passage, you can do a little bit of analysis. So um, people buy prestige when they buy a premium product. They want to be associated with something special. Mass marketing techniques and price reduction strategies should not be used because blank. One of the things that can be very helpful, so these complete the passage questions are relatively rare, um, and but and they are of course a very different task, like the uh, bold-faced argument ones, which is what we get next. Both actually hinge on identi correctly identifying what the special part of the passage is actually doing for the argument. In this particular case, we need to figure out what what part of the argument this sentence is. People buy prestige when they buy a premium product. They want to be associated with something special. Um, those things are the evidence. The conclusion then is that because people buy prestige when they buy a premium product, they, and because they want to be associated with something special, therefore mass marketing techniques and price reduction strategies should not be used because. Okay. The way you can identify evidence and conclusion. One of the ways, of course, is to look for conclusion words. You know, you could see a thus or a therefore, or, you know, even in conclusion. Um, when you don't have that, though, the conclusion is the one that it makes the most sense to put one of these words in front of, or one of these phrases in the case of in conclusion. So it absolutely makes the most sense to put in conclusion in front of the sentence that has what people should or should not do. So the first two statements, or first two sentences in this passage are statements and uh, just statements of fact, the third sentence is one um, that has a prescriptive action saying, hey, this is what should happen. Manufacturers should, you know, or mass marketing techniques and price reduction strategies should not be used. Therefore, and, and so that's the conclusion. You can put therefore in front of that and it makes a lot of sense. So what that tells us in this particular case, the fact that we've identified the, the part with the blank as the conclusion, it needs to follow from the evidence. Okay, so mass marketing techniques and price reduction strategies should not be used probably because they somehow contradict uh, the point of what came before, that people buy prestige when they buy a premium product and they want to be associated with something special. Mass marketing techniques and price reduction strategies probably undermine that notion. Let's look for that in the answer choices. Uh, choice A, affluent purchasers currently represent a shrinking portion of the population of all purchasers. Well, if anything, that might actually weaken or be, you know, kind of a 180 of what we're after. If, if uh, affluent purchasers are a shrinking proportion, mass marketing techniques and price reduction strategies might actually make more sense. If almost nobody can afford to buy your product, you either, or, or you know, the, if almost nobody is likely to buy your product, Lowering the price and increasing the advertising 
are the ways to get it into more people's hands and collect more people's money. So it definitely can't be A. That does not follow from the stuff that we have so far. Uh, choice B, continued sales depend directly on the maintenance of an aura of exclusivity. So that it's different wording from what I was predicting just now, but this sounds a lot like what I said, that basically this air of exclusivity, this thing that uh, it's an exclusive product or it has this reputation or uh, perception of being exclusive, um, if, if, if people lose that perception, they're not going to be willing to continue to pay for it. And mass marketing strategies and price reduction schemes, um, just to read it back into the sentence, mass marketing techniques and price reduction strategies should not be used because continued sales depend directly on the maintenance of an aura of exclusivity. So the more mass marketed something is, the more accessible it is, the less exclusive it is. Choice B is awesome. Let's read the other ones, though. Again, identifying wrong answer choices. I would say that, um, is this true? I would say that identify, uh, certainly um, critical reasoning is one of the top two places where learning to identify wrong answer choices is as helpful as identifying correct ones, or almost as helpful. Obviously, knowing the, knowing the right answer is always the best strategy. Um, but the GMAT is set up so that you won't necessarily know what the right answer is 100% of the time. Anyway, so we definitely need to go through wrong answer choices. Choice C, purchasers of premium products are concerned with the quality as well as with the price of the products. Um, introducing quality is not actually um, in, in question. We're actually talking entirely about price and um, kind of marketing, which doesn't really have to do with quality directly. Uh, choice D, expansion of the market niche to include a broader spectrum of consumers will increase profits. It might, but that, that ending to the sentence directly contradicts the notion of, mass, of using mass marketing techniques and price reduction. So with complete the sentence, things you should actually, or complete the passage, you should read it back in to make sure it makes sense. Here's a, the, so just listen to this. Mass marketing techniques and price reduction strategies should not be used because expansion of the market niche to include a broader spectrum of consumers will increase profits. Oh gosh, we would not want to increase profits. That would be terrible. So this is an example of you know, the second half relating very clearly to what the passage was about, but taking it in the opposite direction and it making gibberish of the argument if you put that into the blank. Uh, choice E, manufacturing a premium brand is not necessarily more costly than manufacturing a standard brand of the same product. Quite possibly true definitely irrelevant to the argument as presented in the passage. That gives us choice E. Uh, because again, we're not talking about the cost of production, we're, we're talking about consumer perception and uh, kind of the consumer end of things. So production in choice E is out of outside the scope of the passage. Still page 490, number 16. No, number 17. I'm sorry. As much fun as that one was, I don't want to do it again. So this is one of those other types of passages that are relatively rare on the GMAT, but uh, you do still need to know how to handle them. This is one of those bold-faced ones, in case that isn't obvious from looking at the page. Hunter, so this is a hunter speaking. Many people blame hunters alone for the decline in Green Rock National Forest's deer population over the past 10 years. Yet clearly, black bears have also played an important role in this decline. In the past 10 years, the forest's protected black bear population has risen sharply. An examination of black bears found dead in the forest during the deer hunting season showed that a number of them had recently fed on deer. In the hunter's argument, the portion in boldface plays which of the following roles? And um, identifying the role of a boldface part, I mean, that's basically... I'm trying to think off the top of my head. I can't think of another type of question that they ask you. So if they if they give you um, boldface, and sometimes there will be more than one portion of the argument that is put in boldface, so you'll actually have to identify what each part is doing. Um, but I can't think of another thing that they do with that off the top of my head. So when you see the boldface thing, you automatically know that you need to that you need to pay attention to what that boldface sentence is doing. Always with arguments, it's easiest to identify the conclusion first. What's the conclusion? Um, the hunter's conclusion is definitely 
Yet clearly, black bears have also played an important role in this decline. Um, so th that's the hunter's, the hunter's. The hunter is saying, no, no, no. Black bears have played a role. The evidence then is that they've, you know, there's been a sharp increase in um, in bears, and they found that some dead bears were eating deer. Um, and so, I think it might be a little bit far fetched to call the first sentence, the bold faced one, evidence, um, but it's definitely something that the hunter doesn't agree with. Because everything else that the hunter says is is contradicting what what's in the bold faced thing that many people blame hunters alone for the decline in deer. Okay, so let's look for things that make sense in the answer choices. Choice A, uh, is it the main conclusion of the argument? No, the next sentence is the main conclusion. Is it a finding that the argument seeks to seeks to explain? No, the author isn't trying to the hunter isn't trying to explain why many people blame hunters. If anything is trying to contradict that, he or she. Uh, choice C, it is an explanation that the argument concludes is correct. Uh, that's actually the opposite. The hunter thinks that it's not just uh, hunters that have reduced the deer population. Uh, choice D, it provides evidence in support of the main conclusion. No, it's actually opposite the main conclusion, which is that bears are doing some stuff, which again leaves us only E and process of elimination tells us that's good enough. But E, let's just read it anyway. It introduces a judgment that the argument opposes. That sounds exactly right, and in fact, it is. Answer choice E. If anything, those bold-faced ones are, are more just about... Uh, they can be challenging because it's a kind of a different approach than what many critical reasoning passages actually ask you to do. So that changing gears thing is uh, one of your main opponents. Kind of like getting all of a sudden getting a symbol question in the uh, quant section, where it's not that it's that hard usually, um, but it's very different from what you've been asked to do the rest of the time. OK, so number 18. In Asia, where palm trees are non-native, the tree's flowers have traditionally been pollinated by hand, which has kept palm fruit pro productivity unnaturally low. When weevils, known to be efficient pollinators of palm flowers, were introduced into Asia in 1980, palm fruit productivity increased by up to 50% in some areas, but then decreased sharply in 1984. So, uh, which of the following statements, if true, would best explain the 1984 decrease in productivity? So, um, you know, this it could be a lot of things. Um, it's it, it basically the, this type of question um, we need an outside factor that makes sense, okay? They, they had just four years before introduced these weevils, which are bugs, um, which, are pollen which apparently are good at pollinating palm fruit, and those were going strong for four years. We need a reason why four years later things stopped. Maybe something happened to those weevils. Maybe, you know, something else started eating them. Um, maybe something happened to the plant. You know, maybe there's uh, some kind of plant disease that went around. We need something that affects, basically, basically, we really only have two things going on in here. We have palm fruit and weevils. And I suppose we have people, too. I guess if the hand pollination that people were doing uh, stopped, but that wasn't even working that much anyway. So we had palm fruit plus weevils equals awesome. Um, Something had to have happened to one of those two things in order to have, to have productivity drop because they were going great for four years. So A, prices for palm fruit fell between 1980 and 1984 following the rise in production and a concurrent fall in demand. So um, that's one of those money ones in the answer choices that doesn't have anything to do with what we were talking about. Also, it turns out that weevils are not really responsive to supply and demand. They don't check the market. They would continue doing their little weevil business, pollinating uh, palm fruit, regardless of what the market actually required. So um, the notion that these little bugs are following Wall Street or something, um, it's not a logical conclusion. So it's not A. Uh, choice B, imported trees are often more productive than native trees because the imported ones have left behind their pests and diseases in their native lands. 
Well, um, that really doesn't explain anything because uh, palm fruit trees are non-native. It says so in the passage. That was true in their low product productivity phase before when people were the only ones doing the pollinating. It was also true once the weevils were introduced and the little bugs were doing the pollinating. So the fact that they were non-native um, does not have an impact on what happened in 1984. Choice C, rapid increases in productivity tend to deplete trees of nutrients needed for the development of the fruit producing female flowers. So choice C here has something happening to the palm fruit trees that could produce uh, a change in productivity. So we'll keep that one as a possible one. Choice D, the weevil population in Asia remained at approximately the same level between 1980 and 1984. So while choice D does do something to the weevils, all it says is, hey, nothing happened to them. So, you know, really that uh, weakens the notion that it was anything to do with the weevils because they, it, their population stayed the same. They, they, they caused an up to 50% increase in productivity for four years and then stopped with the constant population. Choice D does not do it for us. Uh, choice E, prior to 1980, another species of insect pollinated the Asian palm trees, but not as efficiently as the species of weevil that was introduced in 1980. Well, um, you know, unless something happened to that insect in 1984, and we don't get that in the answer choice, that does not explain why productivity dropped sharply in 1984. Only answer choice C, that there was a, um, uh, that because of this rapid increase in productivity, the trees had fewer nutrients in the soil for their female flowers. Um, that alone of the answer choices explains the drop in productivity after four years. Okay, page 491, question number 19. So this is a physician talking first. The, horm the hormone melatonin has shown promise as a medication for sleep disorders when taken in synthesized form. Because the long-term side effects of synthetic melanon me melanonin, melatonin, ha ha ha, I can read, uh, whoo, because the long-term side effects of synthetic melatonin are unknown, however, I cannot recommend its use at this time. The patient then responds, your position is inconsistent with your usual practice. You prescribe many medications that you know have serious side effects, so concern about side effects cannot be the real reason you will not prescribe mel melatonin. The patient's argument is flawed because it fails to consider that. Um, right. So... Um, the patient's argument is that the doctor prescribes uh, things with serious side effects. And the argument is because uh, things with serious side effects are prescribed, that something with unknown side effects should be prescribed. I'll just write should be. So um, there's there's a there's a little bit of a disconnection here in the patient's argument between just because these things have serious side effects and the doc the doctor prescribed them that something with completely unknown side effects should also be prescribed that somehow knowing what these serious side effects are translates to uh, what the what the patient actually says um, you, concern about side effects cannot be the real reason you will not prescribe medication. So we have serious side effects that the, that the doctor is willing to prescribe, but not willing to do it with unknown ones. And the patient claims it's because the, the doctor doesn't really care about side effects. So let's look for something that kind of touches on this, this shift in the nature of the side effects, because that's really, that's really the shift in the, page, in the patient's argument. There's a logical leap there. So that's probably where the flaw is going to be. Uh, choice A, the side effects of synthetic melatonin might be different from those of naturally produced melatonin. Well, so this is one of those false splits. We don't actually, I mean, while we do hear about synthesized melatonin, uh, we don't hear about comparing it with the naturally produced kind. So uh, it's one of those fake distinctions that occurs. 
Choice B, it is possible that the physician does not believe that melatonin has been conclusively shown to be effective. Um, well, you know, so the physician actually directly says it has shown promise as a medication for sleep disorders. If the um, physician didn't think that it was conclusively shown, um, why would the, the, the doctor probably wouldn't say it has shown promise. The, the doctor would say it has not been conclusively shown. So I think we can trust the doctor to say what he or she believes. Also, it doesn't really impact the, um, uh, the patient's argument. The patient's argument was that, hey, the side effects aren't the real reason you aren't, you're, you're, you're unwilling to prescribe it. Uh, choice B actually gives another reason that the doctor might be unwilling to prescribe it and hasn't actually said. So if anything, choice B strengthens the patient's argument. Uh, choice C, sleep disorders, if left untreated, might lead to serious medical complications. So true and so outside the scope of the passage. Uh, choice D, the side effects of a medication can take some time to manifest themselves. Remember, uh, time and money in the wrong answer choices. Time, the length of time that it takes for the side effects to manifest, is not part of the, of the argument. It's not going to be part of the answer either. Uh, choice E, known risks can be weighed against known benefits, but unknown risks cannot. So uh, the doctor is willing to prescribe things with serious side effects. Um, and, and if we use choice E, that is when the doctor knows what the benefits will be. Something with unknown side effects, um, it's impossible to weigh that against what the known benefits would be, in this particular case, sleep disorder. So choice E is, is definitely the most promising. Had we started with choice E, I'm not sure it would have jumped out at us as being quite as obvious. Um, but by process of elimination, and clearly by emphasizing the uh, split or the shift in logic between serious side effects and unknown side effects by kind of honing in on that, uh, homing in on that point of the patient's argument, it makes it clearer that choice E is um, the right answer. All right. Page 491, number 20. In recent years, many cabinet makers have been winning acclaim as artists, but since furniture must be useful, cabinet makers must exercise their craft with an eye to the practical utility of their product. For this reason, cabinet making is not art. Right. Uh, which of the following is an assumption that supports drawing the conclusion above from the reason given for that conclusion? Yikes. Well, let's actually just kind of break this down. What is the conclusion of the argument? The conclusion is cabinets are not art. It's the last sentence. And we need the assumption that supports drawing that conclusion from the reason given for that conclusion. Um, and the evidence is clearly marked with the statement since, but since, so that's, that's our evidence. No, don't, oh, sorry, pen stopped working. <laughs> so the evidence is um, that uh, cabinet, cabinet makers, um, they have to look to utility. So remember, uh, and I talked about this last time, that when you have, um, uh, sorry, evidence plus the assumption, uh, let's actually write that out, <laughs> uh, equals, equals the conclusion. Uh, that a lot of times terms or elements or ideas from the assumption will appear in the conclusion that weren't part of the evidence. So if the evidence is X, Y, and the conclusion is Y, Z, the, the assumption might is probably going to have Z in it. Okay, So uh, in the conclusion appears this idea that cabinets are not art. 
what constitutes art is not listed in the evidence, therefore it is part of the assumption. And uh, we can actually, by kind of putting two and two together, the, the idea is that probably that utility does not equal art. Because the, the author actually says, because they have to look to the utility of the product, the practical utility, that makes them not art. The author doesn't say that having to look to practical utility is not art, but that's an assumption that the author is making in the argument. Let's look for that in the answer choices. Uh, choice A, some, some furniture is made to be placed in museums where it will not be used by anyone. That's true, but that isn't the assumption. If, if anything, that would strengthen the idea that cabinet makers could win a claim as artists. That's not what the author is saying, though. Choice B, some cabinet makers are more concerned than others with the practical utility of the products they produce. I'm sure it is kind of a sliding scale, uh, but that doesn't actually uh, address, again, we're looking for something that looks like this. And knowing that some people look more to the utility than others doesn't, uh, that's not an assumption the author is making. Choice C, cabinet makers should be more concerned with the practical utility of their products than they currently are author doesn't care about that. The author thinks that they just shouldn't be considered artists. Uh, choice D is the assumption that an object is not an art object if its maker pays attention to the object's practical utility. Well, that sounds exactly like what we thought it would be. And then choice E, artists are not concerned with the monetary value of their products. Remember, time and money. Um, choice E is the money, the money trap. Um, so choice D is the correct answer. This one, the author is assuming that well, when you have to look to utility um, that you're no longer creating art. That is the missing step between the stated evidence and the conclusion. So it's answer choice D. All right, last one. Page 491, question number 21. Male bower birds construct elaborately decorated nests or bowers. Probably, hence the name. Uh, basing their judgment on the fact that different local populations of bower birds of the same species build bowers that exhibit different building and decorative styles, researchers have concluded that the bower birds' building styles are a culturally acquired rather than a genetically transmitted trait. Okay, which of the following, if true, would most strengthen the conclusion drawn by the researchers? What conclusion did they draw? They drew the conclusion that the style and technique equal um, their cultural or learned things. It's not something that the birds just are born knowing how to do. And so we need to strengthen that. Strengthening arguments usually consists of either taking um, the assumption and uh, basically stating it as additional evidence um, or providing additional evidence that further supports the point. So strengthened questions are usually a little bit rarer because they're a little bit easier. Uh, because if you understood the argument, you already have a sense of what might strengthen it. It's not always the case. There are some very challenging strengthened questions, but they tend to be a little bit easier because there's fewer tricks that they can pull on us. So we need to strengthen the conclusion that the style and technique of bower birds nest building is cultural or learned. Choice A, there are more common characteristics than there are differences among the bower building styles of the local bower bird population that has been studied most extensively. So if there are more, more in common than there are differences, that it either leaves, it, it's either neutral, or if anything, it slightly weakens. The more similar that they are, the more likely it is that they come from a common source. It could still be learned culturally, but um, the whole thing about cultural traits is that they can manifest themselves differently in different locations. And if the, uh, if the birds, despite, um, you know, if, if, they, if they stay more or less the same, it suggests that it's not as cultural. So uh, not A. Choice B, young male bower birds are inept at bower building and apparently spend years watching their elders before becoming accomplished in the local bower style. So this one explicitly has them learning how to build these bowers, which that's kind of what we're hoping for. 
Uh, choice C, the bowers of one species of bowerbird lack the towers and ornamentation characteristic of the bowers of most other species of bowerbird. So this one sounds kind of tempting, saying, hey, this one is totally different. It has towers and ornamentation that this other one doesn't have. Um, however, the passage is about one species of bowerbirds, that there is there are differences in the bower building techniques within the same species. Things that are the same species are genetically, they, sh they share the same genetic background. Um, and so introducing another species, as choice um, C does, is outside the scope. It would not be weird for bower birds of a different species to build their nests differently because they have different genetic, they have different genes. That's not C. Uh, choice D, bower birds are found only in New Guinea and Australia, where local populations of the birds apparently seldom have contact with one another. So this is kind of irrelevant. If they are, if, if bower building skills are genetically inherited, they don't have to, they wouldn't have to uh, see each other at all. They wouldn't have to contact each other at all. They would still build nests the same way, regardless of whether they ever saw each other. And if they didn't, that would suggest it was, was cultural. Um, this doesn't really support the point. We need to show that it is cultural. Uh, choice E, it is well known that the song dialects of some songbirds are learned rather than transmitted genetically. So this one's related, um, that it shows that some birds learn things growing up, but we need to strengthen the argument that the strength and uh, technique, the style and technique of the bowers or the nests is what's cultural and learned. Knowing that songbirds learn their songs is interesting and potentially relevant, but it's a pretty weak strengthening. It's not nearly as strengthening as choice B, which says, hey, these male bowerbirds of this species have to watch and learn how to do it. So choice B is our correct answer. So, okay, and we will stop there for today, uh, just in time. Uh, thanks for joining me. My name is Jim Jacobson. You've been watching Grocket.com, the GMAT edition where we go through the official guide. Uh, we will pick up next time on the next page, page 492 with question number 22. That next time, barring illness or uh, accident, will be tomorrow morning. Well, it's morning for me. It might not be morning for you. Anyway, I'll see you next time.